Hello and welcome. So our working language will be English, as we have uh, known Armenian attendees also. And my name is Vahram, and uh, we are going to talk about parallel architectures and parallel pro programming. So this is um, one of the uh, kind of very modern and at the same time kind of ancient uh, topics like uh, parallel architectures are there for many decades and uh, from one point of view but from the other uh, we still don't really know how to do it. I mean we are, we are still creating some new approaches to parallel com computing to parallel archi architectures and thinking about how could we uh, create even better parallel programs. So, um, do we have programmers here? Okay, using any parallel technology or any anything doing in parallel? But only in practice. Sorry? Only in practice. In practice? Uh, okay. Multiprocessing. Multiprocessing. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, Okay, um, so I think we all know that uh, our phones have CPUs in them, right? There are CPUs, and we probably know that the CPU has cores. So do you know how many cores your phones have? Four. Four? Uh, I don't know exactly. Okay, any guesses? Like, is it one or is it two? Eight or four. Eight. Yeah, okay. So we usually will see that there are CPUs and they have four or eight or maybe sometimes 16, right? Cores. So what does this number tell us about? It's kind of part of the CPU which really, well, in ancient days, a single CPU was just one core. So we can think a multi core CPU as. Uh, of something, some integrated, complex, uh, uh, multi-CPU CPU, right? Each core is a separate CPU. In fact, they do the same. They do whatever the old CPUs were doing alone, like, is the same. But we have many of them. So if we try to visualize, let's say if this is my CPU, it, it's a very uh, uh, not uh, precise uh, some kind of uh, diagram because it's not really like this but let's say if this is my CPU then I have cores in it and each core itself is kind of another CPU that that could do whatever a CPU is supposed to be doing so uh, well in fact CPUs it's, uh, uh, it's the central processing unit so it is processing data or uh, to be more precise CPU is doing computations, right? It's not about, um, I don't know, flying to space or something like that. It's just doing calculations, computations, it's adding numbers, it's multiplication, it's shifting data, moving data around and stuff like that. So uh, CPU can be considered as an electronic hardware which does computation or calculations. And Okay, now we have many of them, and one would just suppose that if I have many cores, then probably each core would, would be doing some calculation. So if I have eight cores, then I can probably hope <laughs> for now that uh, they, they could be doing eight calculations at the same time, right? That would be good. I mean, if we have eight cores, probably all of them must be doing calculations. And our overall calculation time then would be eight times less. That's, that's a kind of uh, um, same magical uh, feeling that some magic would happen there and I would get that done. I mean, let's say if I have a calculation, I want to calculate this sum for some particular uh, n. I have an array of data and I want to get the sum so uh, that would be great if eight cores would cooperate somehow 
and make it happen eight times faster, right? I have many numbers to add. They could be separated between different cores and could be calculated somewhat simultaneously. But it turns out that no magic happens. So there are many cores, but if you write a program like on C, say something like four, i equals to zero, blah, 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 and I want to add everything to some sum, right, like this. This is not going to happen any kind of in parallel. So it is just a sequential code, and it, it is going to consume just one of your cores, and will be just implemented sequentially. You see? That's how the world is now. I mean, we have many cores, but we have languages that are kind of sequential. So we cannot magically consume our rest of our cores. We can some kind of um, bring an analogy. Let's say we have many desks here, but as far as there is no enough people, the desks are useless, right? They are empty. I mean, no use of empty desk and no use of uh, CPU or a core if it's idle. So, um, from one side, we know that kind of parallel architectures are there, but on the other side, parallel programming is not there, or it's not always there. Let's say when at Intel uh, there is a brainstorming session to, uh, to come up with ideas for the next generation of CPU, a team is uh, sitting and discussing, and discussing, and if someone suggests let's add more cores, then probably he will be thrown out from the window because no one needs more cores because the cores are not being used really. Have you ever seen your uh, CPU being completely busy, all the cores busy? Have you seen that? Have you ever experienced? No? Never? I mean, it is so strange, right? So why would my CPU be busy? I mean, then why do you have these cores? Why do you have eight cores if only one of them is usually being used on 20% like something, right? Usually one core and about 20, 30% of uh, utilization. So why do we need so many cores anyway? We don't need them. Most of the time the cores are just being idle. They are doing no operations for many, many cycles. Okay, um, in the um, old days, <coughs> CPUs were kind of uh, one piece of uh, hardware, uh, a circuit, which was connected to some other hardware, which we usually call memory, and uh, this is a bus. Let's say it's a memory bus which connects the CPU and the memory. So <clears throat> this architecture is called von, ne von Neumann architecture. It comes from the very beginning of modern computation er era, like from the 40s of the 20th century. And even nowadays when we have many cores, right? We have cores here, let's say 16 of them. But they are still using the same memory with a, some kind of same memory bus. Yeah, it could be a double memory bus, but not 8 or 16 bus, separate bus for each core. So we don't have that. We have this bottleneck still. Are you agree? Is it, is it okay? Is it uh, what you know about CPUs, right, and memory, or don't you? Okay, then just trust me. So this is what is happening. And in reality, we have many cores which cooperate with memory using this tiny bus. And th that bus is not enough. I mean, if, if your, all your cores start requesting something from the memory, it turns out that they are just making a queue of requests. And the requests are being processed one after another. Because the bus is just one bus, one wire, some kind of, right? And that wire is busy, so you need to wait. And if it's free, then you can, uh, it can proce uh, process your request. And at the same time, let's also have a look from the memory's point of view. So memory, nowadays, it can be, let's say, a 16 gigabyte memory, right? 
it's very usual to have 16 gigabytes of D, D RAM. So it, it is double dynamic RAM. And well, when the CPU core requests for some part of the memory, the rest of the memory is just doing nothing. I mean, if you think about each cell, there are billions of cells, and most of the cells are just doing nothing most of the time. Do you agree? I mean, they are not doing anything from the uh, computational perspective. Yeah, they are consuming energy, and they are just trying to store the value, not to corrupt the value, right? Something like that. They are just doing daily routine to keep everything working, but they are not involved in the computation. So the computation is happening on, only on this area where my array is sitting, okay? And the rest of the memory is just doing nothing, consuming energy and doing nothing. So we have many cores, most of them are doing nothing, and we have many cells, again, doing nothing. That's the background. I mean, I want to start on, on this layer, on this uh, foundation that we have the potential and some bottleneck and some lack of parallel uh, parallelism in our programs and putting everything together we come up with a situation that we pay for hardware and most of the time the hardware is doing nothing. Our calculation, our computational hardware is doing nothing. Is it okay? I mean, uh, yeah, there are two aspects. First of all, do you agree <laughs> that it's yes. more or less like that? Because we usually don't see our CPU being really busy and we for sure know that most of our memory is just sitting around and not being consumed at any particular time. I mean, you cannot uh, consume the whole memory because you need to request a particular piece of it and that's it. Or you write to some particular block and that's where the processing is happening. Most of the memory is doing nothing. Um, so from one point of view, it's kind of parallel, but uh, as an as a end user, kind of the user of my computer, I don't gain much from that parallelism. And uh, I don't even really see the parallelism. I mean, of course, there is some kind of um, situation where, let's say, you have many processes running, yeah, they are more or less using your cores. If you have many processes really running, I mean, really doing something, not just uh, displaying uh, some site for you or playing music. I mean, it's not enough. Your CPU can do much more than just displaying some site contents, right? I mean, even uh, just displaying something doesn't involve your CPU in it. So it's about, it's not about computations. Your CPU is, is the computer, it computes. So when the site is already generated, the rendering process itself doesn't involve your CPU cores anymore. And what we, uh, but let's say if, if I'm a programmer and let's say, do you use make to build your code, your project? Make. Do you know make? Yes. Okay, so there is make and you can run make using dash j and put some value here. It means that I want to run make for eight parallel whatever sessions. And in this case, make will spawn eight processes probably and try to break down your project into independent parts, eight of them, and try to run eight Com compilers at the same time. In that case, your cores are really going to be busy. And uh, the computation, the compilation in this case, compilation is also a computation. So it is going to consume your cores, consume your memory, your hard disk. And uh, during that build process, if your project is big enough, you will see that all your cores are really busy and the overall uh, temperature will grow, the cooler will, will start uh, run faster to cool down the CPU. So you will really experience the parallel program. And parallel programs really use all your uh, computational power, not your, of your device. 
but not the whole memory. Again, right? The memory probably is not going to be consumed. Uh, but there is a chance that you will also get a good uh, load on the memory also. You can try. I mean, take a big project like the Linux kernel and just build it in parallel, I mean, with this. You will see that your CPU is completely going to be busy for several hours. That is great. So you pay for it and you want it to run. <laughs> That's why we, we buy parallel hardware. Let's call it that way. Okay, so uh, parallelism, parallelism means that several computational processes are happening at the same time on the hardware. Now, let's see how could, could, could that be done or how is it being done. So, first of all, let's start with a very low level of detailization. We probably, all of us have heard of the instruction set architectures, right? It's the command or instruction set that the CPU supports. So it's, it's a collection of instructions that uh, the CPU understands. Let's call it understands, okay? And uh, there is a language, the machine language, which should contain instructions which the CPU will understand. So it must be written in this particular language for, for any CPU so that it can be executed. And uh, on this level, there is a, again the same name, von Neumann has defined the algorithm for the CPU. You know that algorithm? It is also called loop. Von Neumann's loop. Any guesses? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, the loop can be simplified to several steps like uh, the CPU fetches the instruction from the memory then decodes to understand what exactly should be done, right? To understand the operation, its parameters. Um, executes, we can, yeah, it's the simplified uh, version. So the full list contains seven steps. And there can be some memory access, like to store uh, the, the result, right? Probably there can be some memory step. And there can be the need to get to the next command. So next, the next, next instruction. That can be the next instruction that comes right after the current one. Or that can be another instruction if our instruction was something like jump. You know? You know any assembly language or... Okay, so in x86 there is a jump instruction which instructs the CPU just to jump to another address. So, and this loop happens in, in some <laughs> infinite way. I mean, all the time, uh, each of our cores is doing this loop. And uh, obviously, it means that the core takes the first command, processes it, then the second command is being processed, etc. So, in the very beginning of uh, this um, computational boom, like in the 70s already, it was clear that it is too slow. I mean, if I have billions of instructions or thousands of instructions, then the CPU doing one after another is going to spend, I don't know, hours on, on a simple algorithm. So uh, some companies started thinking about how can we make this loop some kind of work faster or what can we do with it? It's, it's too, too sequential. Let's somehow parallelize something. And uh, the, the idea of pipelines was invented. So a pipeline, you know the term? Pipeline? Hoskagitz. Gambier. So a pipeline is the following. When the CPU takes the first command, fetches it, and then uh, it needs to be decoded, right? Uh, at the point when the first command is being decoded, the fetcher is free. Whatever the fetcher is, it is free. So we can bring in the second command, right? Read from memory. And when this command gets to the execution point, this one will be decoded. And the fetcher will again be free, and at this point we can fetch the third command. 
etc. So if we have five steps, we usually have more than five, I already told you, and in uh, modern CPUs, these phases can be even up to 15 or even more. So they have somehow broken down the execution of a single instruction into many, many steps. And in this uh, situation, it turns out that if we have several um, lines, pipelines, right? Or, yeah, in fact, it's just a single pipeline. So on this pipeline, we will see uh, that, well, it, let's say at this moment of time, we have three instructions being processed more or less parallelly, right? So they are not sequential anymore because if this is a particular point in time, then I can really see three instructions being at some stages of their implementation, at different stages, okay, but still they are being processed in parallel. And here we have parallel processing. It's not something cool, something, uh, I mean, it doesn't make any, uh, the whole program to run five times faster or something like that, but still we gain some parallelism. But still, we, we have also problems. Let's say, uh, yeah, let's take this loop. So here is my code, right? This loop is going to be translated into some machine code and on that machine language, um, there must be a check, right? There is a condition here. And if, if i gets more or equal to n, we need to break this loop. And for, let's, let's have a look uh, from the CPU's point of view. So if we have this pipeline, it means that the CPU has loaded the next commands. And what if, sorry, instructions. What if the CPU loads the instruction that comes after four and starts this execution. Meanwhile, we should get back to the beginning, right? So it's a loop. We need to repeat the same operation for several times and then get to the next instruction. What if the third one here was the instruction after the loop? But it shouldn't be get executed, right? We are not sure about this. Because uh, if this one is a jump instruction telling the CPU to get back to the previous one, then the third one shouldn't be loaded or decoded or whatever. Okay, uh, it, 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 this situation is called branching. So branching means when you have instructions and there, there is some branch instruction or jump instruction, then it will cause the CPU to go to some other uh, instruction, not the, not the next one. And branching is a problem for the pipeline because your pipeline is useless in that case if there are br possible branches, jumps. So, let's create someone who will help to predict, okay, predict if this instruction, which is probably a comparison instruction, this one, is going to return true or false. Predict, not to calculate because the CPU is busy. We cannot pre-calculate. We can predict. Let's create a branch predictor that will predict whether we are going to make the jump or we are going to just move to the next comment. Sounds magical, right? Prediction. Is, is it even scientific? Can we create a predictor? Is it going to use some uh, some ball of glass to predict or what? So, I mean, is it really scientific? Yes? Yeah, maybe we can use the data. What kind of data? What kind of data? Previous data that we gained from this. Ah, okay. What, what did we get? What do we have? What can we base our calculations or predictions on? I don't know. I'm talking about you mean previous execution, probably, yes. right? Because we don't have any other data. We have the code and it is being executed. Okay, let's say our brain predictor can just remember that last time you get to this instruction, a uh, real branch happened, sorry, not this, in this area, it's a loop, right? We got back to the beginning. So the brain predictor can store this information and next time we get to this branch command, 
it's a conditional branch, right? Mm -hmm. Branch if it, it is less than n. So it's a conditional branch. So the predictor can say, I can totally recall that last time we did that branching. So we got back to this instruction. It's not a prediction, you see. It's kind of, uh, yeah, you are right. That's what is really being done. So it's not about the future. It's about past. In, in, in past, the prediction, uh, sorry, the predictor uh, knows that in the past you made this kind of jump. So next time we get to this comment, it says probably you are going to jump again. Probably. I don't know why. Because last time you did it. Maybe this time also. And that, that's how it happens, more or less. So for the next iteration, we are going uh, to be quite confident that the third comment shouldn't be taken this one. But we will start from the beginning of the loop. So this command is going to be loaded from the beginning. And the pipeline will be more or less useful unless we get a wrong prediction. So if the prediction is correct, then the pipeline can be loaded correctly and it can bring us this kind of parallelism. Uh, yeah, the branch predictors are now a little bit smarter, but they are not really doing predictions. They are doing uh, analysis of the previous executions and trying to uh, not to uh, make too wrong, too many wrong predictions, let's say it this way. Because if the prediction was wrong and if we got to this point, we got the result of the comparison and we know that it's false, then we are going to execute the next command, right? And it is not in the pipeline, so the pipeline is being just cleared out and we start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So anytime a wrong prediction happens, the pipeline is useless. I mean, we, we remove everything and start from scratch. Okay, so uh, the pipeline is good with the branch predictor and branch pre ah, prediction, okay? And um, we need to have a good branch predictor, and we also need to uh, stress out that this is done in hardware. This is not a comment or a program or whatever. The branch predictor, as, as long as the pipeline, they are just implemented in the hardware. It's part of the CPU. It's not a software, okay? And the CPU got more complicated. And if, if it was like this, then now it is like this. I mean, the size has grown because we need to create more, uh, well, we need to put more transistors, we need to add wires. It is hardware, okay? The branch prediction and pipelining is implemented in hardware. We need to add more registers because on, on these steps we, we need to save the result. So we need registers registers to store the temporary results, etc. So the hardware got extremely complicated just to make this little parallelism. But I think uh, that works. I mean, uh, that uh, the speed that we could gain worth the, the price, right? In fact, the price we have paid and the uh, complicated hardware we get at the end. It's okay, I mean, the world is okay with that. That was uh, the case in in 80s, maybe, or 70, end of 70s, 80s, or maybe I'm wrong about the date, but it was in a, in a very uh, distant year, something, 40 years ago. Okay, now we have the pipeline and it makes things a little bit uh, to happen a little bit faster. But let's say I have uh, a very simple instruction. I have an instruction to add a couple of registers. And this instruction would, would uh, take one cycle to, to be executed if there are no pipelines. So there are two numbers stored in the, in the registers and uh, the CPU will just take them, add them, and put the result back to this one, let's say. And now we have pipelines. This means that this instruction is going to be broken down into several phases. And on each tick, on each cycle, the CPU is going to do one 
step here. And it means that one single instruction is going to take, let's say, five steps to get executed. Is it really fast? I mean, this instruction would take one cycle, now it takes five cycles. Did we get any, any performance? Did we gain something? Turns out that there are two parameters. So first of all, we, yeah, we still have the parallelism, right? We see that there are several instructions being executed. So we, gain, we, we should gain something, and, but we also lose something. So there are two parameters. One is the latency, and the second is the throughput. Maybe this true, no, there, there are some, there should be a GH here, right? <laughs> The latency is, it, it got more, okay? The first instruction that is going to be executed is at least five, right? We cannot get an instruction earlier than five cycles. The latency got much, so we have five instead of one. But the throughput is, that is, is five, okay? If we have five, five steps, then we have five parallel instructions being processed at the same time. And it means that uh, after, after that latency is done, we are going to get one instruction completed per cycle. Because here, we, they are just one after another, right? And the first one is done, and the second is going to be done in the next cycle. So we got the parallelism, and we have five of them being executed. But um, it's not something extraordinary, because we have the branch prediction problem, and it can really break the whole magic that is going to happen here. So, uh, <clears throat> someone at Intel, I believe, thought that this is cool and there was a suggestion, what if we create two pipelines? Let's, let's put more pipelines into the CPU. And uh, by the way, I think that the approach to have many pipelines was, uh, was also implemented in L. Bruce, you know, the architecture created by Babayan. So in, in that architecture, it was again a super scalar architecture, meaning that there are several pipelines in the CPU. And it was the idea created by uh, Armenian architect Babayan, Boris Babayan, who is an Intel fellow. Now he's, he works at Intel. But in those days, he was the architect of L. Bruce. And that architecture was super scalar in those days. So. Uh, the superscalar architecture means that we have several pipelines. Well, okay, it's, it's not really parallelism. Um, then, uh, if we uh, have a closer look to the pipeline architecture, we will see that not all the instructions, instructions are really simple and fast. So this one was fast because these two are registers and the CPU can deal with registers in one cycle. Mm -hmm. But what if one of these parameters would be a memory address? So we have a CPU and we have the memory and they are far away one from another and uh, it is too slow. I mean, for a CPU, the memory is really slow. I mean, it is physically slow and it is far away and we have the bus in the middle because this is another piece of hardware and it has a controller we need to deal with with many details the memory controller bus controller and the memory latency itself and many many other parameters are bringing to the situation when a single memory reference can take about 200 or even more hundreds of cycles so the cpu asks for some particular data from memory and just waits for 200 cycles. You see, we have one cycle, and then we have five or 300 or 200 cycles. So it's extremely slow, and if some of these commands have that memory reference, it means that your pipeline is just going to stop. You will hold all the operations waiting for this instruction to get executed. And it is going to take uh, 200 cycles. So memory goes, but nothing is happening in the CPU. But what if I have some commands that, uh, yeah, some of my commands really uh, depend on this one, but others really don't depend. So we have two kind of uh, commands. And 
What if I could um, bring some of my commands, instructions that are not really depending on this particular whatever happening now, what if I can bring them to some earlier uh, time? I mean, let's say I have uh, several instructions and I know that this one is going to uh, read some data from memory. What if I could somehow make it uh, come to some earlier point of execution? I mean, m do it uh, earlier or initiate it earlier because it is going to wait, right? Okay, let's initiate the memory reference and just wait for it but not blocked. Wait, not being blocked. So we can, can, uh, we can start uh, implementing other instructions while we are waiting for the data. So here we come to some idea of out of order execution. I can bring some instructions to some earlier time and start their uh, execution knowing that it is going to take long so we are just going to be stalled later and uh, I want to manage that somehow but what if uh, I bring some wrong command and it breaks the others so we still need to somehow keep the track of the order and we, we need to manage it and everything is going to happen in the hardware. So it is again a hardware, right? We need to have a buffer, a queue, a first in first out kind of construct in the CPU, which is going to hold the instructions that are being analyzed so that we can bring some of them uh, to, to some earlier time. But still, the results must be fixed in the correct order. All my instructions have an order, right? And this order is the logic, the algorithm of my program. And it cannot be broken. You cannot just scramble them, ra them around and get the same result. So we need really to take care about the order. But at the same time, we want to have an out of order execution because some comments are just very slow. We can start them earlier, okay? And it is also making the overall CPU more complicated, so it, it could get even bigger and yeah, and hard, and hard to implement and uh, expensive and power consuming, etc, etc. So CPUs are going to be bigger and faster, more or less faster, okay? Because, yeah, we want many things to happen in parallel without blockings, without uh, stalled, so that's, that's the idea and I'm not getting into the details, so it's just an overview of parallel architectures. You can have a complete course on this from MIT or whatever uh, university, I think you better to take some, but this is an overview. So, uh, having the out of order execution makes things even more complicated but faster. And, and also there is a good term, it is called speculative execution, it means that uh, speculative. It means that you execute some instructions but store the results in, in different locations. Not in the real register but a shadow register, a copy. And then when the time comes you will replace the, the value with the original one. So during this speculative execution you will get the results in, in some temporary places and you need to handle them to bring them to the correct registers when the time comes. When the order of this instruction has come. Yeah, it is really complicated, I know, but it is what is happening in the CPU to make it more or less parallel. Um, we didn't talk about caches. It's not about parallelism, but it is another technique to make things faster. Caches and uh, prefecture and stuff like that. So there are even more topics that are are there for the performance, but it's not about parallelism. Okay, now when we have this part, the pipeline, branch predictor, out of order execution, the speculative execution, we can think that now some instructions are really being processed in parallel. So we have some kind of internal parallelism. We didn't do, I mean the programmer didn't make any effort, right, to make anything look like parallel or I mean, anything 
even the compiler has, a, has to do nothing with your code as soon as the CPU will internally handle the pipelining execution and all this, all this magic out of order execution, etc. So that magic is happening in the CPU and it is not visible. I mean, it's not in our control. We cannot change anything there. We, we, we know nothing about it except of some documentation or some videos from Intel that that is happening. Okay? We have no control on it, on software level at least. Uh, okay, this is more or less what is being uh, now implemented and each core each core can be thought as of something very complex something very uh, complicated in terms of uh, processes happening in it but the purpose is to get more of your instructions uh, executed at the same time more or less okay we see that here we have several instructions being executed that that's what we gain. Hmm. But it's not enough. So when we start creating cores, um, this magic is not going to work. I mean, we everything we have done is inside the core. So if we take two cores, then how can we uh, load? both of them with a single program. Okay, this doesn't help. I mean, it is another technique to make things parallel, but it's not about programming, parallel programming. So when we come to the parallel programming, then we will uh, have some higher view of, of the picture, and we have now cores. Each of the core is very powerful, very power consuming, okay? And it can do some magic in it. So. What if we write a program that will affect two cores? Can, how can we make our loop be executed on two cores? And here the operating system comes into the scene and uh, we know probably about processes, right? And threads. And they are doing some other kind of magic, making our program to run on several cores. So, for that, we need to put some effort into the programming. We need to break our loop into two sub-loops somehow, create two threads, and each of the threads is going to run to execute part of our loop, and hopefully the operating system is going to use multiple cores to execute these threads. It's just a hope. I mean, it's not in our control anyway. If you create threads, you don't know if they are going to run on the same uh, a core or on different cores. Sometimes you have some hints that you can uh, ask the operating system or whatever, but anyway, the CPU could be loaded, right? And in that case, you are going to have one core and your threads are going to run on the same core sequentially. But if there are two free cores, you can gain the parallelism. So we can split the loop into two parts, I mean N, right? and add the subsums in parallel and then add two numbers together to get the result. So in that case we hope, I mean if we divide our loop to m pieces then we would expect that the time will be something like t divided to m but it's just a very optimistic hope and it is unreachable. I mean if the overall time, sequential execution time of the for loop was t then if we divide it into m threads, we would like to gain this kind of time, right? t divided to m. Okay? Do you understand? Yeah, but it's unreachable, because when you create a thread, you, you add some overhead. You make a system call, or you, uh, you... Also, we need to synchronize the threads, because at the very end, they, are, they have two sub sums, and they need to add them together. So we need to synchronize them somehow, not to break anything and to have... Okay, so we have some additional, additional tasks to uh, accomplish in order to get that parallelism. But we, yeah, we can uh, expect some, um, some, some performance boost, okay, when, when we do that. 
So this is the software part of the process. I mean, we can create threads or processes. And in that case, if there are many cores, it is more or less, it is parallelization, right? In fact, we, we get some parallel execution then. Uh, but nowadays, uh, do you know any field where it is really necessary to do parallel computation, heavy computations? AI. AI. Yeah, AI. <laughs> AI is doing many, many computations. I mean, in order to, to train them, uh, these uh, networks, uh, neural networks, and uh, in, uh, even to just to run a model or something like that, you need to do calculations. In fact, there are just mul matrix multiplications, matrix to vector multiplications happening all the time. And unfortunately, CPUs are not good in it. You know why? Uh, CPUs historically are good at integers. They are dealing with integer numbers. But the real world is floating point. I mean, usually your matrices are going to have floating point elements. Yes, you have a question? That's why. Yeah, so the CPU is, is good with integers, but is not really good with floating point numbers. But in our world, you will see some uh, speed measurement unit. It is called flops. Yeah, we usually write like this, but it is a floating point operations per second. Okay, it's not the plural S, it's the per second. So floating point operations per second is a unit of measurement for uh, computational hardware. Okay, and uh, nowadays we can see exaflops even. Exaflops, exaflops, teraflops, gigaflops. So a uh, conventional laptop would uh, have several gigaflops, I believe, or uh, some high end one, maybe a teraflops of performance. But supercomputers have exaflops. Exa means 10 in 18th degree. It's an extremely large number. So uh, that's where we operate now. I mean, it's giga to exaflops range. But it's not about CPUs. Mostly, mostly. But sometimes it is the CPU. So um, many years ago, there was an, uh, a cluster in Armenia. It, it was called Arme ARM cluster, Armenian cluster. And uh, that cluster had, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, several gigaflops of, or teraflops of performance, so I don't, I, I don't know the numbers, but um, you can now buy a very standard uh, conventional uh, video accelerator, GPU, which would have even more performance than the whole cluster, Armenian cluster of, from old days. That is because of the power of the GPUs, because GPU is the graphical processing unit, and GPUs are good at floating point numbers. So they are created as, in fact, they are FPUs, to be really uh, honest. So GPUs deal with floating point numbers, not integers. Okay? And GPUs have cores also. And how many cores do they have? Any, any number? 16. 16? Uh, CPUs also have 16. It's thousands. Thousands. Yeah, really. GPUs nowadays can have thousands of cores. Let's say it can have from 24 to whatever, 2048 cores. Okay? If you pay more, you will get more cores. I mean, it's really about, it. and sometimes these cores are not really called cores. It is called the computation unit. And it means that it's not a real core from this picture. It's not a CPU core, it's a GPU core. GPU core is a very small and very uh, simple circuit which does floating point computations really good. And you can have many, many of them in GPU. And now we come to the question, how can I write a program, a for loop, right? We still have this, because it is, I mean, when you multiply two matrices, what do we do? We calculate the sum of multiplications, right? I mean, it's really something like this. You take 
A I J and B J L, right? A double sum or whatever. No, sorry, not not, not double sum. And this will bring us to C I L element of the resulting multiplication, the matrix. So uh, it means that yes, we really need to calculate sums, and <laughs> that's that's what we do. I mean, the CPU and the GPU also just does multiplications and uh, additions. So if you have many cores and you have the for loop, you want your for loop to be magically separated between the cores and run in parallel, but still the magic doesn't really happen. <laughs> and uh, now we need to come up with some better tools, not the C++, the language itself is not enough. And there is a special language, it is called CL, not C++, but CL, so it is more or less the same. I mean, if you switch from C++ to computational, CL means computational language. So CL is almost the same as the C++ is, plus some keywords to control the memory buffers you use or the parameter function parameters. So there are different types of memory, internal, private, shared, etc. So that's what we, we do with uh, CL. The rest is just C++, okay? It, I mean, syntaxes and the semantics is the same. So you write your code on CL, then you write some additional code to manage your program runtime and make it run parallel on cores, on many cores, GPU cores, and it is done in a very easy way. I mean, an infrastructure is being created for that. You can um, probably read about OpenCL and its implementations, and also the CUDA approach is there by NVIDIA. So these two approaches will help you to write parallel programs in a more or less easy way, not creating threads, but it's more about defining that I want this function, by the way, there's a special term, they are called kernels. I want this kernel to run on this many cores, okay, and the rest is handled by the infrastructure, the platform. So NVIDIA creates its platform, Intel provides its platform, AMD creates its, Apple has its own platform, etc. Okay, there are many platforms provided by the hardware companies, both for the CPU, GPU, and even more. <laughs> and now we come to the, uh, to the very specialized hardware. So GPU is specialized in graphics, but it's not specialized in matrix multiplications, okay? GPUs calculate pixel colors and intensity, the light. That's what they are created for. But now we use them for our regular computations. So what if someone creates a, a, an even more specialized hardware? Yeah, and someone already has done it, and it is called a TPU. And there is also, uh, okay, <laughs> there are also NPUs. Have you heard of them? So TPU is the tensor processing unit created by Google. And tensor comes from the TensorFlow library. And tensor itself is a mathematical term. So <laughs> tensor, matrix, and vectors, they are all from mathematics. And NPU means neural processing unit, which is more or less the same idea. And uh, in general, we can even call them AI engines. You can see that some, uh, some CPUs have AI cores or AI engines in them. Have you seen any? Have you ever seen any CPU which has AI engines in it? I bet you have, or I hope you have. <laughs> Okay, or AI cores. Uh, if you have a detailed look at Apple M1 and M2 chips, you will see that they have AI engines in them. Let's say 16 AI cores or AI engines, I don't remember the exact term. Uh, and they are NPUs. They are really good at matrix, matrix, matrix to vector multiplications. <clears throat> and there are even more specialized hardware they are called DSPs, Digital Signal Processors. It's a processor again, but it's a signal processor. And uh, processing a digital signal, it usually means to do an FFT transformation, fast Fourier transformation, you know? 
yeah, it's math, okay. Some mathematical magic is happening there and you get some uh, more uh, valuable or meaningful information out of uh, audio stream doing an FFT and doing an FFT usually means to do some multiplications and additions. Let's say DSPs are good in uh, such way, such calculations. A plus, A plus B times C plus D. So a DSP can have a special instruction with four parameters which will calculate this expression because it is a very special expression happening quite often when you are doing FFT or other types of DSP. Okay, so we can have different layers, levels of uh, specialized hardware, and uh, but they are so the parallelism here is still about having many cores, right? Still, no magic happens. You need to do some more, uh, some extra. Um, you need to put some extra effort as a programmer on your code so that your code becomes. Access or, or sorry, gains access to these specialized cores and runs in parallel, runs faster. Okay, as a programmer, you need to do something. It's not magic. I mean, the operating system cannot handle it. The CPU cannot handle it itself. The compiler cannot handle it. Okay, but there are some pieces when the compiler can help us. Let's say. Um, all of these types of, let's say CPUs, even CPUs, have the entity of vectorization. You know vector operations. So you can have uh, something like an addition on not two single scalar values, but on two vectors. It means it will take two vectors containing n elements each and do addition between them resulting into a new vector with n elements with, where in fact if this is C, this is A and this is B where CI is equal to AI plus BI so this is a vector operation and if the, if the CPU has the power of doing something like this then I can load the whole vector into register A another vector into B Vector means an array, okay, or um, C++ vector. I mean, it's, it's not something magical. And uh, I run this addition command, it's vectorized version, and I get a vector in one single whatever cycle. Or if there is a pipeline, then in any way, it's just a single instruction, okay? We can have eight elements being added to another eight elements in a single instruction. And it makes things to run eight times faster in a single CPU core. I mean, the one core now is vectorized. Now it is like that. I mean, Intel creates, Intel has the vector uh, subset, AVX. ARM has its own vector subset of instruction. It's called ARM Neon, and they are there for many years, and you can make use of it. And there is even more. There are even more specialized and ultra high performance, etc., hardware called advanced computation acceleration platforms. You see the term <laughs> advanced, it means it's not an ordinary CPU or whatever. Computation, well, acceleration, so platform. Uh, as an example, you can check uh, Versal, Versal by Xilinx, so now Xilinx is acquired by AMD, so Versal by AMD. And it is an advanced computation acceleration platform, meaning that it is a, it is a single chip which contains two CPU cores, one FPGA, 400 NPUs, I mean AI cores, and two thousands of DSPs in a single chip. Chip, not a board, a chip. A single chip contains several thousands of cores, DSPs, NPUs, CPUs, and FPGA. We, we didn't talk about FPGA much, but it is still there. And you can just, you are just limited by your imagination on what kind of parallelism you can get on such a hardware where you have two thousands of DSPs and stuff like that. So you can use that chip in, in many, many areas. And uh, you will get a real parallel execution when you have some good support 
uh, an infrastructure which will help you to put different pieces of your program on the different cores or different types of cores of, on, on that platform. Yeah, and, uh, of course, there must be a very smart compiler to do the vectorization for you. That is done by the compiler, usually. And putting everything together, it turns out that from one side we need these smart and specialized hardware to do better calculations. And on the other, on the other side we need some special languages, compilers, operating system support. Let's say there must be the SMP and symmetric multiprocessing support by the, uh, by the operating system so that it can uh, manage your threads on different cores. And putting all these solutions, hardware and software solutions together, <coughs> yeah, and also the compiler, uh, the vectorizer, right? There must be a vectorizer. So it's a compiler which does the vectorization. And if you have all of them together, and also the knowledge of how to parallelize my algorithm, that's another kind of knowledge. Okay, that's just, that's a different knowledge, okay? Parallel programming. So if you know everything, then you can outperform. I mean, you can really create programs uh, that can gain all the benefits of parallel hardwares and give uh, power to the end user, right? There is an end user <laughs> starving for power and performance. Okay, uh, if you have any questions, we can uh, discuss after the session. I'm still here. We are out of time. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>